imagine you have a huge cruise ship and you turn on the engines. It takes enormous amount of fuel and a considerable amount of time just to get it moving. If after all that you realize that the ship is going in the opposite direction than it should, you can hit the brake and suddenly reverse direction all you want, but the huge ship will keep moving in the initial direction for a good while before it responds to your new instructions. On top of that, Imagine that half the crew, to avoid looking bad, keeps stubbornly insisting that the initial direction was the right one. Well, good luck with that. And yet this is a metaphor of what happened when the lipid hypothesis stemming from Dr. Key's work was translated from theory to practice, with governmental guidelines and huge official prevention campaigns. There was increasing evidence that the lipid hypothesis, as it was initially formulated, was seriously flawed. And yet it's on those guidelines that generations of physicians and dietitians have been trained. The population at large retain the idea that fats are bad and that animal and saturated fats must be especially dreaded. One of the first practical outcomes of all this was a marked decline in the use of butter and an increased consumption of vegetable oils. However, especially in the US, it was not the olive oil that the Greek were using, but other vegetable oils such as corn, soybean, and sunflower oils. As we will learn, this brings about two big problems. Number one, their lipids are much more unsaturated and thus prone to oxidative damage, which makes them toxic rather than healthy. And then, number two, they provide an excess of one particular kind of polyunsaturated fat, those belonging to the omega-6 family, which ends up altering the ideal balance between fats of another family, the omega-3. And then there was another problem. Saturated fats have been historically widely used by food industry as ingredients of a lot of processed food for many reasons. They are more stable and resistant to rancidity, and they give unique texture and flavor to many foods, including bakery goods, spreads, and ice creams. Plus, there is another very practical problem in substituting butter with oils. They are not exactly the same thing, and in particular, thanks to its saturated fats, butter is solid at room temperature so you can spread it on bread. You cannot do that with an oil, which at room temperature is liquid. The answer to all these problems came thanks to a technological process known as partial hydrogenation, which makes it possible to take an oil and makes it semi-solid or solid. The product you obtain is margarine. You can make it from vegetable oils, but you can use it like butter. The trick is the formation of trans fats. They are unsaturated, but with the same properties as the saturated ones. A perfect alternative to be able to claim vegetable oils in the ingredients list, but still have a long shelf life and a solid, rich, flaky texture in baked goods. Unfortunately, after having dominated the food industry for years in margarine, salad dressings, spreads, snacks, cookies, french fries, potato chips, donuts, ice cream, and many more products, trans fats turned out to be not even just as bad as saturated fats, but much worse. So in trying to emulate the Mediterranean diet, where people took all of their fat from olive oil, olives, and fish, and thus had plenty of healthy monounsaturated fat and a good omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, the US population started taking its fat from seed oils and hydrogenated margarines, which had neither the monounsaturated nor the omega-3s, but essentially omega-6 and trans fats. As we will soon learn, that's a disastrous thing. On top of all that, the generalized fear of fat translated into the food industry developing a plethora of low-fat or fat-free alternatives, which came with their own set of problems. Number one, these products tend to induce overindulgence. Because they have less calories and have an aura of healthiness, people believe that they can eat more. But less fat doesn't necessarily mean less calories. We already know that fat gives unique contributions to texture, color, flavor, taste, and aroma of many of the food we like so much. It makes a steak tender, a soup creamy, a french fry crispy, a pie crust shiny. We cannot just take it out and leave it like that, as the product will be disgusting. We need to replace it. There are some non-caloric fat replacers, such as Olestra, but they are not versatile at all. They are quite expensive, and they had raised some concerns in the past about interfering with the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins and carotenoids. 
They are mostly used in some savory snacks and little else. What happened in the vast majority of low-fat products is that to maintain texture and flavor, fats were replaced with sugar in horrific amounts. There are many products advertised as low-fat or fat-free, but whose sugar content is insane. This is often the case of low-fat flavored yogurts. Look at this one, for example. Low-fat, then you look at the carbs and in just one serving there's 33 grams, 26 of which simple sugar. It's three tablespoons full of sugar in one serving. Or maybe a gourmet drink. Many times you ask it with skim milk and that makes you feel better. But you don't realize that syrup is added. This skinny iced chai tea latte, for example, has 40 grams, four spoonful of sugar in just a few sips. To cut the story short, the US population started getting less and less of its energy from fats, but more and more of it from carbs coming from added sugar and refined grains. It also became more and more obese, so clearly this didn't help. The US diet became low fat, but the US population became fatter than ever. It is to be noted that the total amount of calories also increased over time, and this is the most important contributor of the obesity epidemics. What's the take-home message of all this story? To put everything in a better perspective, in the 1990s came yet another set of data, this time from France. The interesting thing about the French is that they had the exact same level of fat consumption as the US population, not only the total amount, but also the quality. But their incidence of cardiovascular disease was much, much lower than the US, much to your dismay. Why this French, with all their cheeses and butter and sauces and dressings and terrines and cold cuts, they eat the same levels of bad saturated fats and cholesterol as we do and they don't die of cardiovascular disease? This became known as the French paradox. After a superficial look at the data, someone suggested that that happened because they would also drink more red wine. If red wine had anything to do with it, it certainly wasn't what made the difference. The trick is that together with their bad fats, the French were also eating a lot more fresh fruit and vegetables, legumes and whole grains, as it was very clear from the very same set of data that originated the paradox. And this once more tells us that diet in general is always much more important in preventing disease than any single nutrient or class of nutrients. You can still have a poor fat quality in your diet, but then you can save the day with the rest of your diet. Focusing all your attention on just one aspect of diet, forgetting everything else, is never the right strategy.